Amen. Glory to God. It's good to see everybody here this morning. Praise God. I love the house of God. And God's given me many, many uh, more visions and things for us to do. We've got a lot to do in these end times before Jesus comes again. Yes, a lot of things are coming, but glory to God, Jesus is coming. Praise God. You can look up. You see your redemption draw nigh. A lot of people are wondering what the blood moons signify in the heavens. And just to really quickly tell you, and I'll get into the message here in a second. In Genesis chapter 1, the Bible says the star, the sun, and the moon are for signs and seasons. The word signs is a Jewish word, oath. It means beacon, flag, or signal. And the word seasons there is not spring, summer, winter, and fall. The word seasons is a Hebrew word, moad. It means divine feasts or festivals, okay? So the Jewish feasts... Would, uh, the sun, the moon, and the star would be signs of the Jewish feast. And these blood moons are happening on Jewish feasts, Passover and Tabernacle. So what I believe it is, it's a sign to Israel, especially for them not to divide the land. The Pal- with the Palestinian 1967 borders dividing the land, Joel chapter 3 says that. That's what I believe it is. Uh, that's, they had blood moons in uh, 1967, 68. Israel regained the Temple Mount. Okay, So if we want to understand prophecy, you've got to look at Israel. That's what God told me. Look at Israel. Look at the fig tree that blossomed. Look at Jerusalem. And listen, it's happening. Things are happening right now. So glory to God. I'm excited to be alive. Praise God. A lot of good things happening. Although we see a lot of things going on around us, amen, we've got to look up to Jesus. Let's pray. Father God, I want to thank you, Father, for the honor and per- privilege to stand before your saints. Father, I pray, put your heart within my mouth for your people to prophesy to them the healing word, delivering word, creative word. Father, if it's not in this message, Lord God, cause it to come forth of the richness, Lord God, of your spirit to your people. Today we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, over the last month, my associate ministers have been ministering. I know uh, Jimmy Minister, Joey, and Nikki last week, and they all do a great job. We're so blessed to have these guys. They're so anointed. Don't they do a good job, guys? They really, really do. <laughs> and I, I really feel privileged to have that. Amen. I, I remember I was talking to a minister once when I told him my staff. He said, you have such an amazing staff. I mean, we, I could go down to all you guys. I could start naming you how gifted you are. And, and uh, one of the pastors of a very large church said, man, you're going to have a large church one day. And I often say, I'm the pastor of a 5,000 member church. They say, really? I say, yeah, I'm missing about 4,800 some odd people, but they don't know I'm their pastor yet. Praise God. It's not about numbers. It's about saving souls and making disciples. Amen. That's what we want to do. Glory to God. I've got some visions on planting churches all over the place. Amen. Give the devil a headache. Praise God. Amen. We're going to begin looking at the seven churches of Revelation. Uh, I'm going to be on the Church of Philadelphia, okay? Uh, Nikki did a Sardis last week. Now, the book of Revelation, preachers a lot of times shy away from this book, but we are living this, okay? We are seeing this happen in the news, literally. This is the only book that promises us a blessing if we read it and we hear it. And amen, I want a blessing. Revelation 1, 3 says, blessed, happy to be envied is the man who reads aloud in the assemblies the word of this prophecy, and blessed, happy to be envied are those who hear it read and who keep themselves true to the things that are written in it, heeding them and laying them to heart. So not just hearing, but laying it to your heart. For the time for them to be fulfilled is near. Now it's amazing that he said the time is near, and you say, well, Pastor Joe, 2,000 years have gone by, and it hasn't happened. As a matter of fact, the Bible says in these last days there'll be scoffers that'll say, where's the sign of his coming, man? We, he hasn't come. Well, the, the issue is how God reckons time. He reckons time different than we reckon time, okay? Second Peter 3 and 8 says, and this is a reference from Psalm 90 and 4, he said, nevertheless, do not let this one fact escape you, beloved, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is as one day. Now, if you divide 24 into 1,000, you're going to get 41.66. So that means one hour of God's time is 41.66 years of our time. So in the last century, about 100 or some odd years ago, he said he's coming. Well, he's only a few hours out. Amen. I believe he's a few minutes out. He's coming. He's coming. In 1988, when everybody thought he was coming in 88, and I, I mean, listen, I, you know, we didn't know when he's coming. Every, everybody has predicted a date and a time has always been wrong. But all we can do is look at Uh, like a a woman who's pregnant about to give birth. Amen. We can look and and we don't know the day and the hour, but we can see the season. I believe that. But he said to me, I was preaching in a local prison and I read this scripture as Simeon was in the temple and Simeon was a man who blessed Jesus and it was revealed to the Holy Ghost that he would not see death until he saw the Lord's Christ. I heard the Lord say, that's for you and for this generation. Amen. We're going to see the Lord's Christ. We all the generation is going to see the Lord's Christ. 
Now, if you knew he was coming back tomorrow, how would you be living? Would you be living like you're living now? Or would you be, man, I got to go preach the gospel. Listen, there's an urgency. We have to redeem the time. We've only got so much time. And we've got to redeem the time. That's why I don't want to do good things. I want to do God things. I want to do what God wants me to do to stay focused on what he's planned. Now, like Peter, in his epistle, I want to remind you of a few things. Because uh, it's been a while since we started this series on the churches. And I'm going to go over really quick. Uh, some of the churches. Peter said uh, in 2 Peter 3 and 1, stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance. So I want to bring some things back to your attention. Uh, the seven churches of Revelation, that's the first part of the book of Revelation. Why seven churches? Uh, why not Colossians, the church of Jerusalem, or any other church? Because every one of these churches had a perception of themselves that was wrong. Some of them thought they were wrong, uh, were doing great, and some were not. So it's Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. Now, there are four applications of these churches, and I want to mention this to you just to remind you of this, because it's been a while since I shared this with you. Each literal church of that day, it was a letter to, okay? Sir Ramsey excavated these churches, and they were literal churches. So archaeology, you know, people don't believe the Bible. Listen, I don't need archaeology to prove it to me, but archaeology proves it to other people. I believe it by faith, amen? God's given me that spirit of faith, and I believe it, and so he's given it to you. The second thing, elements of all these churches exist in churches today. Elements of these seven churches are happening in church today, ch churches today. We're going to be talking about Philadelphia, uh, and God willing, next week or maybe the week after, or after our guest speaker, we'll be talking about Laodicea. Uh, there's a personal application to every believer in these churches. Something you can find in these churches is going to speak to you about the condition, because you are the church, right? I am the church. We are the church. We're the, uh, the, t the temple of the Holy Spirit. He lives inside of us so we can apply this to our life personally. You know, if, if all you have is theology that fills your head, you need Jesus that fills your heart. Theology is the study of God. So we study the Bible to know God. Not just know all about God, but know God and have a personal, intimate relationship with Him. And so many people, uh, uh, so many people many times just have a lot of knowledge, but that knowledge has got to drop 18 inches to your heart. You have to have a personal relationship with Him where you talk to Him. And God wants you to know Him. He's a personal God. Amen. He'll speak to you right where you're at. He'll talk to you with things that you understand, and He's going to relate it back to His Word. He's personal. Now, there's a history of the church, prophetically in these churches, that some see, and I'm going to mention this to you. I'm going to show you this. Um, now, I want to say this, something about God. And parents, remember this whenever you correct your kids. If you notice in the book of Revelation, the first thing he does, he says, this is what you're doing good. This is what you're doing bad. And he says, and if you change, this is what I'm going to do. He always gives a promise of reward. Sometimes we are so negative because we can only see the negative in people. God wants us to see the best in everybody. There's something good in every person here. I don't care what you've done. I don't care where you've been. I don't care if you say, Pastor Joe, I've been out, you know, on, on drugs at, at night before. I've been in the wrong bed. God put a deposit. There's something good in everybody. And God's got a plan. And especially when you come to Christ, a holy thing was birthed in you. Christ in you, the hope of glory. The hope of glory. You know, I, I'll share, uh, I've shared it many times. If I, let me see if I've got any money on me here. I think I might. No, baby, you didn't find this. This is she money. That means she didn't know I had it, okay? But when she finds it, it's called he money. He doesn't have it anymore, okay? Now, this is a $20 bill, right? So I can step on it. I can drag it through the mud. I can do all kinds of things to it, but it doesn't lose its value. You have value. Everyone has value because they've been made in the image of Christ. And he paid the price and died for us. Now, if I wanted to buy something and I trade this money for what I buy, I am valuing what I buy more than the money in my hand. You've been valued. You've been valued at the price of God's life. God died for you. That's how precious you are. There'll never be another one like you. Don't ever say you're no good. Don't ever say you're trash. Don't ever say you're not valuable. You are unique. There's never going to be another one like you. You have a unique fingerprint no one's got your fingerprint you are precious to God and don't ever think that you're not so well pastor Joe where'd you get that God told me that God told me that he literally told me that when I said God I'm no good I all this stuff when I first got saved and God said how much am I worth and I said you're priceless he said and I gave my life for you so how much are you worth that's really really simple really simple now, of these churches, only two churches have no good news, Thyatira and Sardis. Sardis was the dead church, like the preacher that stood up in front of the Methodist church, and he said, I got, I got a word for y'all today. And they said, what is it, preacher? He said, y'all are going into rapture first, and they all got excited. Glory, we're going into rapture. Or some of them got excited. Some of them didn't move, but he, he said, haven't you ever read the dead in Christ go first, right? The dead 
Okay. Sardis, the dead church. Thyatira. Thyatira, that was the other church that didn't have any good news. The Middle Ages church that was mixed in with the world. Two churches had no criticism, Smyrna and Philadelphia. Smyrna was a persecuted church. Listen, brother, this isn't history. This is happening right now. Little, uh, people being crucified for Christ in the Middle East, literally hung up on X's and crosses, heads being cut off. This is happening. There are slaughterhouses in Syria right now. Where Listen, I personally saw a video on this. And I, I, do I recommend you see it if you could stand to look at it because it's that difficult. It's a leaked video from a cell phone of people's bodies hanging from their feet and their heads are lined up on the wall it is Christians that would not convert to being Muslim and would not deny their faith and they're being persecuted right now this is happening right now we have a pastor sitting in an Iranian jail and when we signed the Iranian deal we let him rot there and didn't deliver him wow this is the world we live in right now and it's the world that Jesus talked about when he's coming back again so Smyrna, the persecuted church that, and, it, and Smyrna means myrrh and bitter and Philadelphia we're going to talk about today brotherly love now the first thing I'm going to remind you, Ephesus was the first church desirable for the Lord. They did everything right, but they lost their first love. Don't ever lose your first zeal for God. Be zealous, but be filled with knowledge, but be zealous. The Bible says zeal without knowledge is not good. So you go off half cock, not knowing what you're doing, you're going to create a lot of problems. But you've got to have knowledge and zeal. Amen. Just because you're older in the Lord, you ought to love Jesus more, not less. I love him more. I've been saved 30 years. I'm more on fire now than I've ever been. I love Jesus more now than I've ever been. I'm more in the word now than I've ever been. I'm more seeking after God now than I've ever been he's just oh my goodness he's that good I know so much more of him some of us look back to that first experience well I got touched and I prayed in tongues once you ought to pray in tongues every day and in churches today they're trying to say well tongues are not of God they won't allow the Holy Ghost to move and that's why they don't have anything supernatural if God shows up shouldn't something supernatural happen something he's God and when he shows up on the scene, some people get, get, get freaked out, don't know what to do. In the denominations, they've kicked him out. And he, it's like he's knocking on the door trying to get in. They lost their first love. Don't lose your first love. Just refire, man. Refire in the word. Stir it up. Stir. You know how to stir up bad things, right? You start thinking about all the stuff that people did to you, and it just stirs the wrong thing, right? It just stirs up some stuff. Start thinking about all the good things. There used to be a song, When I think of his goodness and what he's done for me, when I think of his goodness and how he's set me free, I want to clap, clap, and dance, and just go, oh, my goodness. Start thinking about what he's done. You say, well, Pastor Joe, I just got saved yesterday. Start thinking about what he did on Calvary. Praise God. He redeemed you. Ought to make you shout. Some of us shout more at a football game at a guy carrying a pigskin across the line. And I'm more dedicated to that. You quote all the stats for fantasy football and you don't know any scriptures. I'm here to tell you Sean Payton's not coming when you're sick and your marriage is on the rocks and your kids are on drugs. Sean Payton's not coming. We're dedicated to that. I mean, hurry up, Pastor Joe. Get this sermon done by 12. And I say this all the time. You, you might have a sickness in your body troubles in your home and it's like fix it all pastor joe and do it in 35 minutes because we got a game on brother <laughs> oh yeah yeah be dedicated to go to that more than god listen i like to watch football but i love god way more i love god more than anything else amen amen i love seeking god hearing from god there's nothing better listen guys i love the holy ghost i love the move in the holy ghost i love just everything he does because it's wonderful he's wonderful second church of Smyrna means bitter and Jesus came to him actually I want to say this really quick the first church Ephesus he said I am he who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands in the church and authority in the church Jesus is the pastor of this church he is Lord of this church he paid for it with his blood amen and he walks in the midst of us and listen that's been literal there's been times that I, you know we've had visions and experiences where the Lord was literally here actually sat on this stage right here so if that freaks you out, it should, and that should be normal, right? God shows up. With two or more gathered together, there in my name. There I am in the midst of them. Smyrna means bitter, the persecuted church. And to this church, he said, these things saith the first and the last who was dead and came to life. Now this is a church that suffered under ten Roman emperors of persecution, fed to lions, uh, put on poles and covered in tar and became torches for Nero. They suffered great persecution and it's happening now. It was a bitter experience and he wanted to encourage them that he who is, it, it, I'm going to read it again, says he is the first and the last. That means he's going to have the last word in your life. Nobody's got the last word in your life and if somebody's allowed to have power over you, God allowed it. That's what Jesus told Pilate. Pilate said, don't you know that I can crucify you he said listen you aren't given this power but from above 
No man can have power over him except the Father said so, and no one's going to have power over you except the Father said so. He is the Alpha. He is the Omega. He is the beginning. He is the end. He is the first. He is the last, and he's going to have the last word in your life. The devil is a liar. He's a liar. So he told him he's the first and the last who was dead and came to life. And many of them died for their faith. Many of them died for their faith under those ten Roman emperors. So he reminded them that we've got the victory in Christ. You know, the greatest victory, Calvary looked like a defeat to the world, but it was the greatest victory. And many times for a Christian, when you die in faith, the world will say, oh, look, that's a defeat. No, it's a great victory. You grabbed heaven, and you can't kill a Christian. You're coming back, glory to God. On resurrection morning, the trumpet's going to sound, and the dead in Christ are going to rise, and you're going to get a new body, glory to God. And we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together to be with the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. That's what the Word of God says. That's the word. You can't kill a Christian. They're coming back. Praise God. Job said, look, in my flesh I'll see God. He had a revelation. He knew he was coming back. <laughs> the next church is Pergamos. It means mixed marriage. Do you know you have been betrothed to God? I don't know if you know that. The name of this church, what guy is going to name a church a bride-adorned church? When we play baseball, I was like, what do I put on the shirts? Brides? Uh, yeah. BAC worked pretty good. But we are the bride of Christ, the sons and daughters of God. We've got a wedding, amen. Jesus is coming back. Do you know in, in, in the Jewish understanding of scriptures, there's a ketubah, a marriage contract. And this is what happens. Let's say I have the, I'm a father and I have sons. What I would do is uh, my son, we would prepare a house. We'd prepare a place. And I would tell my son when it's ready. Then I'd say, go get your bride. But he would sign a contract with the woman first. He would sign a contract. It'd be a, a legal agreement. It's called a ketubah, saying all that he was going to do for his bride, all that he was going to uh, prepare. And when he was going to marry, he would go to her and say, look, I go to prepare a place for you that where I am, you may be also. And he would go off and prepare the house and come back. What a picture of Christ. That's what Christ told his people. He said, I'm going to go prepare a place for you. And he's coming back. And if you will, the New Testament is like a ketubah, a marriage contract. You've been betrothed to Christ. Mary was betrothed to Joseph. And the Bible says he knew her not until she brought forth her firstborn son. Then after that, the wedding was consummated. So this is what I'm here to tell you. You're betrothed to Christ and the consummation of the wedding's coming at the coming of Christ. Where we go up to meet the Lord in the air. That's coming. Pergamos means mixed marriage. It means a marriage to the world. That's what the church did. The world's getting churchy and the church is getting worldly. And we've got bishops saying, that this is a homosexual bishop. There's no such thing. It's a man in sin that needs Jesus. That's what that is. We've got things now I never thought I'd see in the church. Amen. And, and preachers are afraid to say the truth now because they might offend this one. They might offend that one. But the person being offended is God. We've got to preach his word. We, get, we don't water it down. We just, had to, we just had the Lord's Supper, which was a picture of the Passover. Do you know the Passover could not be sodden with water? You were not supposed to water it down. We're not supposed to water the word down. How would you like to go to the doctor and get some watered down medicine? It wouldn't work too good. Some of us need some strong medicine of the word of God to heal your body, deliver your mind, restore your marriage, break the yoke of drugs and addiction off of your life. You need the strong stuff, uncut, the word of God, the word of the living God. He cast out spirits with his word he delivered people with his word it's the word of God that we preach that's going to heal save and deliver by the power of his spirit we've got to have his word you hold in your hands and you have the bible the the logos you see what happens is the spirit breathes this is spirit inspired I like to say from Genesis to the maps and when and what happens the Holy Ghost breathes on that and it becomes rhema to you it becomes real in you John 1 12 and the word was made flesh and dwelt amongst us what happens when this logos becomes rhema to you it becomes flesh in you and your healings manifested Jesus becomes real to you because the Holy Ghost will make him real to you the same spirit that raised Jesus to life is in you so you ought to have some life in you but there's some power in you. We sing songs. There's power, power, wonder work in power in the blood of the Lamb. His blood is alive. Devils know it's alive. In Jesus' ministry, they cried out, I know who you are, the Holy One of God. I like to say the devil had a testimony, and some people are so dumb. The devil even knows. They saw Jesus, I know who you are. I've had it happen one time, and casting out a devil. I literally casted the devil out. It said, Joey, we're going to get you. And I, and I wasn't afraid. I said, glory to God. Paul, I know. Jesus, I know. And brother Joey, I know. Praise God. Hallelujah. 
Oh, boy, I say, come out, devil. Shut up and come out. Amen. There's power to deliver and heal in the name of Jesus. Pergamos, mixed marriage. Don't be married to the world. Some of us are courting the world. Don't marry the world. That's this world system, trying to be like the world, getting your ideas of the world. You know, we look at the movie stars. They're, if they, they have a successful marriage, if their marriage, five, marriage lasts five years, then they move on to somebody else. Listen, we got preachers doing the same thing. God's word has not changed. I marry my wife for life. Glory to God. In Christ. Amen. That's the way it's supposed to be. Don't look at the world to get your ideas and the way you dress, designer clothes. Listen, I say this all the time. I still cannot wear jeans with rips in them. It bugs me. I know y'all are in style, but I'm never going to get in that style because we was poor and I had patches on my clothes and I was so embarrassed of those rips. And I like to say I was in style years before y'all. Glory to God. Some people called it poor, but I was just in style. That's what it was. <laughs> I'm old school. I still got the same haircut for 30 years. I'm just thankful I have hair to cut. Praise God. That's all I got to tell you about that. He goes to Pergamos and he says, in Revelation 2, 12, he said, the angel of the church of Pergamos or the messenger, the leader. Listen, as a leader in the house of God, I am very responsible to stand before God. He's going to hold me to a stricter judgment. Right? You expect me to live a certain way and God expects you to live a certain way before him. It says, these things saith he without the sharp sword with two edges. The word of God is a double-edged sword. It'll cut you and cut others. It is to bring division and divide. And if you will, divide us from the world and the things of this world. Many times we're so clinging to the things of this world, everything's going to pass away. Everything's going to melt. The element shall dissolve with fervent heat. And we build up everything in this life, and it's all going to pass away. I had a library of 20-some-odd years filled with books and knowledge that I had amassed. And I figured one day I'll just leave that to my kids uh, of all the Christian books and that I had amassed. And Katrina, in one day, took it all away. One day. One day. Glory to God. I'm glad I had it all memorized, so praise God. <laughs> no, I wish I did. One day, it changed. Thyatira, the next church that we had talked about, Brother Joe preached on this. Perpetual sacrifice. Do you know in denominations, they go through the motions and the presence is not there? It's like offering up Jesus over and over. He was offered up once, once and for all. He, he died and rose again, never to die again. Glory to God. And many denominations, they go through the motions, and it reminds me in the Old Testament when the, the Ark of the Covenant, where God's presence was, presence was at, was uh, in a place called Shiloh, and God removed it from Shiloh, but the priest would still go through the motions of everything without the presence. How many people are going through the motions without the presence? You kneel, you stand up, you recite something over again, and it doesn't please God at all. God wants relationship. How would you be pleased with a relationship like that when somebody just, just me mechanizes the relationship? I tried to do that as a believer, mechanize the relationship. Well, I'll read through my one-year Bible, and that's all I'll do. One psalm, one proverb. Listen, God wants to speak to you. He's a personal God. Yes, read through the Bible, but have some personal time and say, God, what do you want to do? What do you want to talk about, God? And fellowship with Him and talk with Him. Too many people don't spend enough time with God. Just talk to Him. The Holy Ghost wants you to know. He says, I am ever with you. If you'll just talk to Him, God's saying, you'll hear my voice. I've been speaking to you, but you've been drowning me out, says the Lord. Don't drown him out. He's there right next to you. Never going to leave you and forsake you. But you got to get quiet in his presence. Thyatira, he says this. He describes himself uh, as the son of God with eyes like a flame of fire and feet like brass, okay? Now, when you say you're the son of something, that means, if you will, you're just like that thing or have the nature of that thing. The son of the sorceress has the nature of a sorceress. The sons of thunder, James and John, had the nature of their daddy. And the son of God is, is like the father. So when you see Jesus, you see the father. And we call ourselves sons and daughters of God. So we ought to reflect his nature. I'm going to say this to you really quick. The word for sons in the Old Testament, sons of God, was always used of angels. But in the New Testament, it's not. It's used of believers. And there's two Greek words. One is technon. One is euios. Technon means you've been born. Like when I had my children, they were born to my wife and I. And we couldn't really tell exactly who they looked like. We said, well, he's got your nose, my eyes, or whatever. But in a, after a period of time, they begin to grow. And then when they begin to reflect what we believe, our nature, our character, they become a euio. So here's the picture. When you get... Born again, as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. Through the power of his spirit, through the power of his blood, you became a technon. You got born again, but yet you were not reflecting God's character. God wants you to grow in the word of God, so you begin to reflect his nature of love and mercy and grace and character in Christ. 
You become a yuyos. The Bible says as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. That's the word yuyos. That means a mature believer that reflects God's character are led by God's Spirit. I'm going to preach myself happy. Praise God. Oh, my goodness. Sardis, which Brother Nicky talked about last week, means escaping ones, barely making it. You don't want to be a white-knuckle Christian just barely making it. Oh, you know, don't, 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 you know, wondering if, if when somebody passes away living like that, you wonder if they made it or not. Don't leave anybody wondering. Don't leave any doubt. Get so deep in Christ. There's no question where you went. No question where you went. I've done funerals where you're looking at the family, wondering, they're wondering this, and you want me to tell them where they went. I'm not God. I don't know where they went. You better live right now. When the planes are going down and, and, a, and a plane crash and they listen to the black box, I, I haven't yet heard anyone say, listening to the black box, this is what they heard, Lord Jesus, come into my heart. Forgive me of my sins. Now, I'm sure those things happen from time to time. But as you live, you die. Many times the people that live a cursing, uh, drug, alcohol-filled life, whatever they're doing, will, will just curse on their way down as the thing's going down. You've got to live for Jesus today. You've got to walk with Jesus today. He said to the angel of the church in Sardis, These things saith he that hath the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. Now this is the dead church. He identifies himself with seven spirits and seven stars. It's the sevenfold Holy Spirit. How many churches that kicked the Holy Ghost out won't allow God to move at all? They think God's finished working, but they haven't read in the Bible. He said, I'm the same yesterday, today, and forever. He changes not. He's the same God. And when God moves, they kick him out. They kick the person in the Holy Ghost out. And all they got is a dead church, all the order of a cemetery. My goodness. And sometimes the seminary is the cemetery. Got to let the Holy Ghost move. A lot of modern mega churches today. Listen, if we grow to 5,000, we're still going to talk in tongues, lay hands on the sick, and cast out devils. We're still going to do it. Not compromising the Word of God. I will not compromise the Word of God. We're going to preach this gospel and do what Jesus did. Amen. Hallelujah. He identified himself with the fullness of the Spirit. The church we're going to talk about today is Philadelphia, the church of brotherly love. Like say, do you love the brother? And amen. It's a church of brotherly love. This church had no condemnation with it. We're going to talk about after that the church of Laodicea, which means the pews rule. A church just run by the will of the people, not by the will of God. We've got to be run by the will of God, not by the will of the people. Amen. Now let me show you, show you. Oh, and by the way, if you see here up in the screen, you see these are church ages with these churches identify with. Ephesus, the first church. Smyrna, the second church. Pergamos, the next church age. Mixed marriage, that's when Constantine uh, made Christianity the universal religion and it got mixed in with Babylonianism. The church of Thyatira, the dark ages, when, it, when it, the word of God was in Latin and you couldn't even read the Bible. Sardis, the dead church. The Reformation church, Philadelphia. And the end time church, Laodicea. And we see that today now. And we'll talk about that. So Philadelphia means fond of the brethren. He sent it to the angel, the messenger of the church of Philadelphia. It means fond of the brethren. Now, it, it got this name not because of the church, as, for say, as Christians, but Athelius II had a brother, King Eumenes II, who was a king of Pergamum. Athelius had a great love and loyalty for his brother, and because of that, it's called the city of brotherly love. Do you know loyalty and love go hand in hand? loyalty and love go hand in hand when you love someone you're going to be loyal to them you see love is not blind love sees and you're still loyal you, you're in that marriage in that thing and it's difficult and you see what's going on you see all those flaws but you love them and you're still loyal to them love and loyalty always go hand in hand when you love Christ you're loyal to him in the gospels Thomas we call him doubting Thomas but let me tell you I want to call him loving Thomas because Thomas Although he had his issues in faith, when Jesus said, I'm going down to Jerusalem, he said, let us go die with him. This man loved Jesus and was willing to go die for Jesus. Had his doubts, but his love was strong. Love and loyalty go hand in hand. Matthew 24 and 10 says, says this. This is a scripture that Jesus talks about the end times. And many shall be offended and shall betray. When you get offended, you'll betray. If you don't deal with your offense, you'll end up betraying. That's what scripture says right there. And they'll hate one another, the opposite of love. And look at Matthew 24, 12. And because iniquity shall abound, that is not just sin, but the bent towards sin, the lean towards sin, the, the attitude of sin, okay? A state of sin shall abound. The love of many, the agape of many, that's the love of God, shall wax cold. Now, I don't tell anybody I'm chilling. You know why? Chilling means wax cold. I'm not chilling. I'm heating up, glory to God. 
And some, some saints need to get in the crock pot of the Holy Ghost and start putting it on hot, you know, a little at a time if that's what you got to do. Heat it back up. Knock off the ice. So I'm going to put it this way. If you're loyal, you're loyal to those you actively love. You're loyal to those you actively love. If you actively love Christ, you're going to be loyal to the house of God, loyal to the, the things of God. You start slipping out of God because you, you, your love starts getting cold and other things start taking preeminence in your life. All the stuff and things that really don't mean anything and you can't take it with you. To date, I've never seen a U-Haul on a hearse. I haven't seen it yet. You can't take it with you. You've got to invest it all in Christ. Put it all in Christ. Put your life in Christ. Now these two brothers had a good reputation for loving one another and they were not Christians. So you see, if you love your family and friends, you haven't done much more than sinners do. Because the Bible says in Luke 6, 32, if you love them which love you, what thank have ye for sinners also love those that love them. So if that's all you do, you haven't done much more than these brothers uh, or sinners do. At all. Now, I wonder, the city of Philadelphia is known as a church of brotherly love, but what is Bride of Dorn Church known as? When they meet you, that's what it's going to be known as. You are the epistle. So if, if they see you as bitter Betty, they're going to think we're a bunch of bitter folk here. You are the advertisement more than any sign when they meet you. See, I believe in grace. I believe in mercy. I believe in God's not looking for a way to put you out, but bring you in. Glory to God. Amen. We want to be known as a church that loves people. Listen, I prayed, God, bring me everybody in debt, in, the, in doubt, in destruction. Whatever it is, send them here, God. We'll love them and build them up. We'll love them and help them and minister life to them. I want to be known as a church that loves. Amen? We've got to actively love the brother. And scripture says this. Let me go back. By this, by, this, by the way you prophesy, by your church structure, right? All that? No. He says, by this, what, the love of God, by this all men shall know that you're my disciples if you love one another, if you keep on showing love amongst yourselves. Showing love. Love's an action word. You keep on showing it. Not just a feeling, you know, I love you from afar. That's easy to do. But it's an action word. That's what Philadelphia again means. Brotherly love. Hallelujah. Let me look at the next scripture. See what time I got. About quarter to 12. And this is, I'm, I'm not finishing this week, okay? Revelation 3 7 this is what Jesus says these things saith he that is holy and he that is true so he uses this to describe his character these are not tendencies with Jesus but this is his character he is holy and he is true he's showing he's showing a, a, a part of his character that's a bedrock of his character tendencies would be something you do just from time to time but God is always holy and God is always true many in our churches today seem to forgot that God's a holy God and try to bring them down to our level. I often say the angels aren't in heaven with a bunch of sunglasses saying, cool, cool, cool is the Lord of hosts. He's saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. Heaven and earth are filled with his glory. The angels cry, holy. But many times we try to bring Jesus down. We try to bring Jesus down, if you will, and put him on a level uh, just, just disregarding his holiness. But he's holy. Anybody who's been in God's manifest presence is going to hit their face. John the Revelator, who put his head on Jesus' chest at the Last Supper, when he did that, when he saw Jesus in the book of Revelation, he fell as a dead man at his feet when he saw the glory of Jesus. I've been in God's presence many times where I didn't know what to do. I was just like, oh, I was just so strong. I was just overwhelmed. Which, by the way, two men that received the greatest revelation in the Bible is Daniel and John. They were both called beloved of God and they sought God and they got the greatest revelations from God. And they had a great respect and reverence for God. Now, Jesus was declared holy at his birth. He is holy. He said, be holy for I am holy. Luke 135, the angel, this is Gabriel that came to Mary, answered and said unto her, the Holy Ghost shall come upon thee and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore, so something's going to happen. When God shows up, something's going to happen. Oh, therefore, when the Holy Ghost overshadows you, if you look in the book of Genesis, and the Holy Ghost hovered above the waters, and if you will, he was hovering, he was brooding over the waters. That's what happens when you get saved. That's what happens, and, and God said, and light and darkness were divided, and God began, began to bring order and division. What happens when the Word of God comes to your life, and God begins to speak over your life, and the Holy Ghost is hovering over you, he puts your life in order. He puts your life in order. 
And it says here, therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. So in other words, you got something as a believer, a holy thing was born in you. When I got saved, I didn't turn over a new leaf. I got born from above. The Holy Ghost came upon me. Something new was birthed in me. Christ was birthed in me. Mary carried Jesus physically. We carry him spiritually. And a desire for holiness was birthed in me. There were some things I didn't want to do no more. I didn't want to drink. I didn't want to smoke. I didn't want to toke. I didn't want to curse. I didn't want to run with the devil anymore because something birthed inside of me. There was a holiness, a cry, a yearning for something more. I knew I can't touch those things anymore. He said, don't touch the unclean thing. If you have absolutely no desire for holiness in you at all, I say it's time to get saved because he bursts that in you. He bursts it in you. The dove doesn't like unclean things. It won't, the dove that Noah sent out of the ark would not land on the dead bodies, but the raven did because it's the nature of a raven. It's the nature of the people that are not saved to drink, smoke, and do all the things that they do. That's in their heart. That's in their nature. But when Christ comes in, a new nature is birthed within you. And remember this, when Jesus was born, he was born in a stable. A stable is a stinky, smelly place. Christ will be born right inside of you. When you're doing your drugs, you're in the wrong bed, all the things you've done, you come to Christ and he washes you and he's birthed in the midst of that something beautiful in the midst of that situation is birthed in you and he's not going to leave you there he's not going to leave you there at all because that new nature comes in he changes you you receive eternal life and abundant life begins a well inside of you i wasn't a reader i start reading and understanding i've read many 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 books i didn't read any books but tarzan books before i wasn't good in school i wasn't good at a lot of things but i received the new birth and my life changed dramatically understanding that i never had gifts that i never had power that i never had i'm not a self-made man i'm a god-made man and anything good comes out of me all glory Glory to God. I'll honor to God. I'm going to honor him with my life. Oh, I know. It's all come from him. All come from him. He did it. He burst that thing in us. Acts 2, 27. And this is what he said. He was holy in his birth. He was holy in his death. We need to be holy in our death. If, if it so be that the, before the Lord comes, if we go home to be with him, living a life of holiness, and we go up to, and go home to be with him. Because thou will not leave my soul in hell, neither will thou suffer thy holy one to see corruption. And he's holy in his present day ministry today. You know, Jesus has a present day ministry. He's praying for you right now. He's lifting us up as a high priest before the throne of God. He's our representative before the throne of God. And the devil is like a prosecuting attorney saying, Father, do you know? Or, or saying, God, do you know what they've done? Look what they've done. They've sinned. And there's Jesus as the high priest saying, my blood has paid the price for them. And Father God says, not guilty. I don't plead innocent. I don't plead guilty. I plead the blood of the lamb. The devil is the accuser of the brother. Amen. Glory to God. He's the accuser of the brethren, which is accuses us before God day and night. And the Bible says in the book of Revelation, which many think all of Revelation is the wrath of God. I don't believe so. I believe the wrath of God doesn't happen till the seventh trumpet because that's what the Bible says. But Satan is thrown down from the heavens in Revelation chapter 12. And the Bible says, woe well unto the earth and the inhabitants of the earth. So that access to God is going to be cut off. The accuser of the brother is going to be shut up. But you don't have to wait till now to throw him down. You want to throw him down now? Plead the blood and say, talk to the blood, devil. Talk to the blood. The blood's talking for me. Oh, yeah. The Bible says about Abel, his blood cried from the ground when Cain killed him. And it said, vengeance. Blood speaks and the blood of Jesus speaks. And it says, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Father, heal them. Father, I love them. I've redeemed them. I bought them with my blood. Father, heal them. The blood speaks for you and shuts up the devil. I feel like I got a word for somebody here. The devil tried to take your kids out and God said, that God's saying to you this. It was my blood that spoke that day, son, over your child. It was my blood that redeemed your child. God wants you to know that. The enemy wanted to take him out, says the Lord, but my blood covered him. It's the blood covenant, son, the blood covenant you have with me. I saved your child. My blood spoke on his behalf, and I shut down the destroyer through my blood, and the destroyer passed over you that day. So shout and rejoice, says the Lord. Your family has been redeemed. I see the blood on you. I see the blood on you. I see the blood on you, says the Lord. Man, I don't know a word of knowledge. Somebody, you, accident. I saw an accident or something. 
and the blood redeemed you. Thank you, Father. Oh, hallelujah. That's called hot off the press, amen? Glory to God. Hebrews 7, 25. Wherefore he is able, everybody say he's able, to save them that to the uttermost, the uttermost, he's able to save. Why? That come unto God right here, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. He's praying. He ever lives. He told Peter, I'm praying for you. The devil has desired to sift you like wheat, but I prayed for you that your faith fail not. He prayed from the devil saying, come on, let me have him. Let me have him. Let me have him. Let me have him. And what the devil meant for evil, God made for good because it broke Peter of his pride and his self-serving ways. It broke Peter of, of, of trusting in his own self. I'll never deny you, but he learned to trust in God. And he grew in love. He grew from filial love, which is just fond of Jesus, to agape love with an undeniable love for Christ that went to the cross and was crucified upside down. His wife was raped before, the, before he was killed by many Roman soldiers. And he was crucified upside down he said I'm not worthy to die like him that was Peter that's what the love of God did that's the transforming power of the cross of Christ oh my goodness I'm going to get saved all over again praise God I'm coming Jesus I'm coming <laughs> he ever lives to make intercession for us for such a high priest became us who is holy he's holy what do you think he feels when he sees babies killed in the womb, he cries. When he sees the wickedness in the earth, he cries. If you're going to intercede, you want God's heart? Say, God, I'll join you in your present day ministry and I'll begin to pray. And God says, I'll give you my heart and you can pray with me. And you'll cry with him. Yes, you'll laugh with him at the victories, but you'll cry with him. He cries over the nations. He cries for the lost souls. And when we get his heart, what moves him will move you. When's the last time you wept over a lost soul that's dying and going to hell? When's the last time you spent time with Jesus? You won't have anybody to urge you to go to adopt the block or urge you to serve in the ministry or urge you to do anything. You're going to say, I've got to save souls. I've got to reach the lost at any cost. But the devil has lulled many of us to sleep. He sang your lullaby and he says, look, let me get you involved in all this other stuff and things. We've got a mission. It's to save the lost. It is to save the lost and preach the gospel of Christ. Every ministry, the culmination is to save the lost and make disciples and go out and win more souls. People are dying every day without Christ, going into an inferno of a hell. And this is the thing that bugs me. Many pastors don't even believe in hell anymore. Jesus spoke about hell more than anybody else. What kind of passionate plea would the rich man, if I could just pull him out of hell right now, where well, the Bible talks about him, it's not a parable, if I could pull him out and put him up on this stage, what do you think he would preach to you? What do you think he would say? He would say, turn to God while you can. Flee to the cross. Run to the mountain as Jesus. Run to the mountain as Jesus. Don't put it off. He would preach to you to get your life right. But he doesn't have to because he's in the Word. He has preached to you. If you just read the Word. You read the word. It's almost 12. Oh my goodness. I gotta, I'm going to go on a little bit. The Bible says in Hebrews 12, 14, follow peace with all men. You know, there was a man, a preacher. I need to tell you the story. He's from Africa. And his wife slapped him in the face. And he got mad and wouldn't forgive his wife. And he got in a car wreck and he died. Verifiably died. Was embalmed. He was dead three days, and at a Reinhard Bunky meeting, his wife brought his body to a Reinhard Bunky meeting. After three days, he was raised from the dead. After three days. And it's ironic that I'm telling you this now, because Jesus had told this man that he was going to be a, the answer to the rich man's prayer of sending Lazarus back, because what happened with this man, he saw heaven, and he saw hell, and God said, this would be your place if this was the end of your life, because you would not forgive your wife. You would not release that thing. And this would be your place. He said, this can't be. I preach. I've done these things that if you won't forgive, you can't be forgiven. That's what the Bible says. And this man now wants nothing to do with strife and arguments and fighting. How many people like strife and arguments? The Bible says, follow peace. Pursue peace at all costs if you can. And holiness. Listen, if you're pursuing strife, you can't pursue holiness because you, you'll be saying things, ugly things, mean things. That's not holy. That doesn't become you. He who slings mud only loses ground. When you answer people back ugly, you lose ground. Don't be ugly back. Don't answer back ugly. Listen, as believers, we shouldn't go around cursing and talking to devils. Talk. I've cast out devils. That's how devils talk. You know that? Devils curse. 
I've heard them. They curse. That's how devils talk. We don't talk like devils. We're sons and daughters of God. There ought to be some grace and anointing in our life where we speak on a higher level. Praise God. As witnesses of the Most High God, as ambassadors of Christ to this world. Follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man will see the Lord. I'm not talking about just standing before him one day, but you won't even see him in the realm of the Spirit. You won't even see him in life and everything that you see. With holiness, God will begin to reveal things to you. I'll give you an example. Last night we went to a little uh, meeting where uh, the sheriff, uh, uh, Randy, Randy, what was it? The chief, police chief, Randy Smith, was serving everybody and was wearing white. And uh, he had barbecue sauce, you know, on all the plates. And he stood up at the end and he, he gave his little talk and he said, listen, I'm so excited that uh, I didn't get none of that barbecue sauce on my white. I, I did so good. Well, this morning the Holy Ghost kind of brought that back to memory and showed me something. He was serving but not defiled. In other words, in our service, we got to keep ourselves from getting the stains of the world on our white garments. When we're ministering and when we're serving other people, to let not the world defile us and make us dirty before God, but to keep our priesthood where we can stand up and say, Father, I've served you. I've ministered to the lost. I've prayed for the sick. I've loved the people. And see, God, there's no spots on my clothes. I'm unspotted from the world. I'm not contaminated by the world. I've kept my garments spotless. I haven't let the world infect me and touch me, God. And God's going to say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Go read about these churches. To him that overcometh, to him that overcometh, to him that gets the victory we've got to get the victory in Christ amen well glory to God we'll get on to this next week praise God I didn't get too far in it but that's all right amen can you say God is a good God and something good is going to happen to me in Jesus name why don't you stand up with me now I would be remiss in my duties if I didn't pray with you right now most of you you may be saved and right with God if there's somebody unsaved here today this is your time. This is your moment. This is your prophetic moment. He said, wait a minute. If Jesus was here, I'd get saved. Well, he sent me to tell you. Glory to God. Amen. To preach the gospel to you. This is your day. And I need to tell you this prophetically. There's angels in here right now. I'm just telling you. I'm going to freak you out, but that's normal, okay? There's angels in here right now. I, I'm, I'm just telling you in the realm of the Spirit. There's angels. Glory to God. They see you. They record it. Just bow your head with me right now. Pray with me. Jesus. I confess you as the Lord of my life I change lordships no longer will I serve the devil but I serve God I give my life to Christ today in Jesus name I believe that you died I believe that you were buried I believe you rose from the grave the third day and Lord according to your word Romans 10 8 9 and 10 I am saved for I've called upon the name of Jesus this day. And also, I need to say this. If you need restoration, God says, I'm going to restore you today. Ask me. Ask me to ask God. Close your eyes, lift your hands. Ask Him for restoration. You need restoration right now. God says, it's not going to happen instantly. God says, it's not going to happen instantly. But it's going to happen. Know this, says the Lord. I've come to restore you. I'm going to restore everything that the devil has taken. I'm going to restore it completely, says the Lord. But it's not going to happen instantly, but it will happen, says the Lord. Through faith and patience, you inherit my promises, says God. It will happen, says the Lord. I will restore you, says the Most High God. But I'm not going to bring you back just the way you were. I'm going to pour on you greater grace and anointing. Hallelujah. As you walk with me, says the Lord, I'm going to pour greater grace upon your life and greater increase. I'm going to take you further than you've ever been, says the Lord. This is a new day for you, says the Most High God take you further than you've ever been says the Lord I'm going to cause you to hear my voice clearer than you've ever heard and I'm going to cause you to prophesy to people says the Lord you're going to speak for me says the Lord and I'm going to put my words in your mouth and know you say how could this be but I've cleansed your lips says the Lord this day I've taken away your iniquity my angel has touched your lips with the coal from the altar and I have cleansed you says the Lord and you're going to prophesy for me to many says the Lord of my goodness and my glory says the Lord and my redeeming power in your life and I am excited about this says the Lord and though I've begun this process today says the Most High God oh thank you Father oh thank you Father God oh thank you thank you Holy Spirit oh thank you Holy Spirit just lift your hands I'm going to bless you right now Father Father 
Abba, I bless and decree favor upon your people. Oh God, I break every negative word ever spoken over them. And I decree mercy and grace. I decree favor and life. I decree goodness, Lord God, and revelation from the Most High God. Let them increase all the days of their life. My name is Joseph, Father, which means increase. And I pray, let an anointing of increase flow down today upon your people. Increase, 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 increase in all the things of God in their life. God, let them be as Joseph in the Bible. Lord, he named his second son Ephraim. Double fruit. And the first son Manasseh, God has caused me to forget. Cause them to forget, Lord God, the hardships with so much goodness upon their life of the double blessing on their new birth. God, I ask this in Jesus' name upon your saints today. And I decree this favor and blessing on them in the mighty name of Jesus. If you need more, more is here. So in Jesus' name, I release you. You may go. If you want prayer, 